Yeah, uh, a little like cuteness overload, and then you get hit with that Bible beat. You know what I'm saying? And then you're just not sure what to do. But let's try it on the count of three. Word up. Ready? One, two, three. Word up. All right, you guys are getting it. It's good stuff. Hey, we're going to dive in uh, to this final piece, actually, of this series that we've been tracking through over the last few weeks that we're calling Word Up. And the whole goal behind this Word Up series is just to help us build a better relationship with the Bible. And that's important for us because so many people have a different understanding or different ideas of what the Bible is or isn't. And, and many of us are trying to figure out, like, hey, is the Bible actually applicable to me? Is, is it relevant or is it really irrelevant? I mean, what do I do with it? Maybe some of you were, were kind of handed a, a leather-bound copy of it as a kid and you were just told, hey, figure it out. Or maybe you were told everything in it is true and so you just need to believe in it. But then you grew up and, and you started to experience life and things got a little bit more difficult and you didn't know how to answer some questions and things just didn't turn out right. And so you weren't sure really what to make of what we know of as God's word. And so we've been unpacking that and we've been talking through that to kind of give us a, a better understanding, not only, but just also to engage in a better relationship. We think that knowledge is power, right? Awareness is always key. And when it comes to the word of God, we had to understand something from the very beginning that I think is going to be important for you to continue to wrestle with as we finish out this series today. And it's found in the book of Hebrews, chapter 4, verse 12 says, for the word of God is alive and it's active. In other words, the Bible is not just another book. In fact, it's not a book at all. It's a historical documentation written by key eyewitnesses that talk about the big God story. And so we, we talked through what that looks like in, in week one. And we said, you know what, that it's sharper than any double-edged sword. And it penetrates even to the dividing soul and spirit joints and marrow. And then the author of Hebrews finished it off with it judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. This scripture is powerful. It can do a lot of amazing things, but, but that only holds true if we actually engage it. That was the challenge of, of week one, and even talking about this series overall, is that, you know what, the reality behind you and I is, is the Bible, it's not an accessibility problem. Many of us have plenty of access to many Bibles. Pastor Troy told us last week you got 4.4 Bibles in your home, and that .4, Grandma's Bible, you know what I'm saying? The cover's ripped off, and a few pages are missing, right? That must be your .4 Bible. You have access to all of it, but the reality for you and I is studies show more and more that people are engaging with Scripture less and less. They're unsure of what that means for them. They're unsure of what that looks like and if that even applies to their life. So we're leaning in because if this is true, if it's alive and active, what does that mean for us? We follow that up with week two. The reality was that, hey, we need to know, is this even reliable? Is it even trustworthy? And so we talked about that. We gave you key eyewitnesses that evidenced the things that actually happen in Scripture, left you to wrestle with what does that mean, the implications of those, do those historical documentations in our life as compared to everything else that we believe in as a culture and a society that actually has no historical value or significance that can even come close to what the Bible has. That's important for us to wrestle with and to know because that takes us to the next step. If the Bible is reliable, if the Bible is trustworthy, then not only should we engage it, but we should learn how to study it. We should learn how to sit in that. And I'm thankful for Pastor Troy leading us in that last week. And, and I think as we kind of wrap up today what we want to talk about, the hope is that this will all kind of bring everything together. So if you missed a week or two of this series, I want to encourage you. You can follow along at citylineonline.org. You can follow along at YouTube. You can check us out on the podcast while you're working out in the gym or running on the treadmill or whatever that is. Just to stay in the loop of what's happening as we continue to build this out. In fact, when we think about building, a question that I want to ask you, I'm going to ask you several questions today that aren't in your notes, but I think it's worth wrestling through. And the first one is this. Have you ever thought about what you've built your life off of or what you've built your life around? What is the significance that your life holds? Have you built your life off your career? Have you built your life off what people think you are as a husband or a wife or as a, a parent or as the profession that you hold? Have you built your life around this idea of success? Well, what is it that you have, have built your life on? What is it that has become kind of the foundation on, on which you stand? And as you're processing through that, I want to ask you an even deeper question that I think is important for us to wrestle through today, and it's this. Would your life change if your Bible was taken away? 
When you think about the foundation of your life, when you think about the, the, the thing that your life is built around, if, if this was ripped away from you, if suddenly we had no access to this, if suddenly someone was to, to come in and steal the Bibles from your home, whatever it is, right, just because they needed them for something, I don't know, right, but you didn't have access to it, would it actually change your life? See, I think a question like this is not to make us feel bad or, or to make us feel uncomfortable in church. It's to bring us to an awareness of what's really going on in our life. It's to bring us to awareness of what, what level of significance do these scriptures actually have in our life. In fact, if you're following along your notes, and I, and I hope that you will, because I think there's some good things in there. I want to cover quite a bit of stuff today, but I think it's going to be good to help you, you know, as you take notes. John chapter 8 says something fascinating. Jesus says in talking about his, his word, he says, if you hold to my teaching, again, words, if you, if you hold to what I'm teaching you through, through this right here, through this word, that's how we get to know Jesus. We said that engaging the Bible is one of the best ways that we can encounter God, to build a relationship with him, to learn about who he is, to learn about his character, to learn about what he says about us. So Jesus says in John chapter 8, if you hold to my teaching, then here's an indication of what happens in your life. Then you're really my disciples. He says, you can think about it, and you can say that you love me, and that you can talk about Jesus all day long, and you can quote some scriptures, and, and you can hold your Bible real tight next to you and feel good about that. But he says, if you're willing to hold to my teaching, then you're really my disciples. Now, why is that so important? Because I think we need to assess from the very beginning that there is a, a big difference between having something and actually holding something. You can have a copy of these scriptures, but actually holding to these scriptures and making it a part of your life, integrating it into your life as a learner or a follower of Jesus, which is another way of saying disciple. To follow the ways of Jesus, Jesus says the way that that's discovered is when you're willing to not just know of my teaching, not just hear of my teaching, but you're able to go to the next level and begin to hold on to my teaching. Now, what's fascinating to me when he talks about this idea of holding on to the teaching, he backs it up with a promise as well. He says, if you're willing to hold to my teaching, then you're really my disciples. And then he says something that, that just kind of blows me out of the water. He says, then you will know the truth, and then the truth will set you free. If you hold to my teaching, then you're really my disciples. And then as you lean into being this follower of Jesus, you begin to know the truth and the truth begins to set you free. Now, when he talks about this idea of knowing, this understanding of knowing in the Greek is, is not just like a, a theoretical understanding. It's not a philosophical approach. It, it's not just like an acquaintance with, like I'm, I'm kind of acquainted with Scripture. This idea and understanding of this word know in the Greek is to come to know intimately. It has every bit of the connotation of intimacy. That it goes beyond just head knowledge and now sinks deep into the core of who we are. Goes from head to heart, just like we said in week one. That, that it goes beyond just knowing about something, trying to understand something for what it is. But now we actually have a one-on-one -on -one encounter with it. it. It's something that makes a difference in our life. And I think that John is trying to point us out this connection be between truth and freedom as something that's absolutely important. Because truth, truth never brings restriction. Truth never keeps one in bondage. Truth will always lead to setting someone free. And it's interesting to me that the people that Jesus were, was talking to in this particular passage were not so sure that freedom was what they needed. They thought they had it figured out. They thought that they understood what freedom actually meant, that Jesus was some crazy. How are you going to provide us freedom? He said it happens through the truth. If we believe in the truth of Scripture, could it be for you and I today that maybe even in the things that we picture as freedom or understand freedom to be, maybe we're still missing it, and it's not until we fully surrender and begin to know this truth that we actually arrive at the freedom that we've never known. See, we love our freedom. But, but, but anytime somebody tells us something or tells us how to do something or, or tells us a different direction to go, we don't like that. It's uncomfortable for us. It feels restrictive. 
But if Jesus is the one that is teaching and we're coming to know him and his heart for our life, could it be that even though it goes against what we thought we wanted and what we thought we needed, the reality, it actually becomes something that is freeing when we're able to trust in the person who actually bought our salvation, the person who actually paid the price on the cross for you and I to actually be free, not to provide restriction. Not to, to, to say, just give you a, a bunch of lists of, of do nots, but to actually open up the doors to living life as he had always intended, to living life to the fullest. If that's the case, then well, how do you hold on to God's word? How would we do that? I mean, what does that actually look like to actually hold on to the truth? Like I said, as we wrap up our, our, our time in this series, I want to talk about just four things today. I want to talk about kind of, I, I guess you would call them commitments, just four key commitments that if you and I make, I think it, it better equips us to hold on to the truth of God's word. For some of you, it's going to be absolutely practical. You've been around church for a long time. You're like, yep, I know that. Yeah, I know that. Here's what I need you to know. Just because it's practical and familiar doesn't mean that it's easy. <laughs> Sometimes uh, one of our biggest enemies, I think, is familiarity. We get so comfortable with things. We just kind of, oh, I know, yeah, I do that. Mm -hmm, I do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but are we still hearing from God as we do that? Or is it time to switch that up? The reality is we all have to sit in this. But the first thing that I'm going to talk about has to be number one. Because if it's not number one, then everything else that I'm going to talk about just kind of is, mm, eh. Right? I want you to think through this just for a second. And going back to the question of what do you build your life on? And we're going to sit in number one for a, quite a bit of time. So hopefully you'll take notes with this. I think the first step in holding on to God's word is you have to choose to establish God's word as the foundation for your life. You choose to make God's word the foundation for your life. Not your career, not your family status, not your financial future, not your retirement plan. Right? Not your goals and dreams, not, not your hopes and aspirations, but that you choose to establish God's word as the foundation for your life. It's the lens in which you see through. It's how you choose to live your life. You live your life following Jesus, learning about the ways of Jesus, so that you begin to implement the truth in your life, and that truth leads to freedom in your life. You begin to stand strong on the foundation that is God's word. Now, we've been learning a lot about foundations recently as we've engaged this building project. Many of you know that we're trying to create some extra space for more people to come to know Jesus. And as we try to knock down some walls and push some things back and put more seats in, there's lots of questions that we're uncovering. And one of those is about foundations. Foundations are so, so incredibly important. The way it's constructed, what it's made out of, how strong it actually is. That question of what you've placed as the foundation of your life is so important because the quality of any structure is always dependent on the quality and strength of its foundation. In other words, the quality of your life is only dependent on the strength and quality of the foundation that it's built upon. The quality of your marriage, the quality of your parenting, the quality of your financial outlook, the quality of the way that you are choosing to make decisions in your life is all dependent on the quality and the strength of the foundation that you placed your life on. Here's what I would suggest. There is no stronger foundation than the word of God. There is no stronger, more firm, more sure foundation than the word of God. And it's interesting to me that Jesus talks a lot about foundations. Matthew chapter 7, if you want to go there in your notes as well, starting in verse 24, Jesus speaking says, Therefore, anyone who hears these words, right? We're talking about word up, right? Here's the words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on what? On the rock. Everyone, not just some, not just a few, everyone who hears these words of mine puts them into practice, takes the next step and begins to implement, begins to live it out. They're like a wise man who built their house on the rock. He continues. I love this part. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because what? Its foundation was on the rock. 
To which you say, well, that's a cool illustration. I can get that. I can understand that. But I need you to understand the significance of what Jesus is saying. He's not just talking about building structures. He's not just talking about this particular person's house. He's talking about your life and my life. He's saying if we can get to the point where we begin to build our life on this solid rock, which is Jesus Christ, a solid, firm foundation that is unshakable. Here's what you got to know, and I believe you already know this. The winds are going to come. The streams are going to rise. Everything's going to beat against your house. I don't know if you've ever been there, but life is kind of tricky like that, right? Where things just kind of start happening. There's twists and turns, and there's ups and downs, and there's all this stuff happening in our life, and we don't know what to do. And many of us, many of us, if we don't have a firm foundation, guess what happens? <laughs> we cannot stand. But Jesus is calling us out saying, if you put your foundation on the rock, if you stand strong on him and his word, guess what? All these things will come, but you will not fall. Why? Because he's bigger than all that stuff. He's greater than all that stuff that you're dealing with. In fact, he continues to go on. I don't have time to unpack it all today, but if you want to continue to read Matthew chapter 7, I mean, after you finish John, right? Like, (laughs) you know, because we've been trying to track through John for like 31 days. Here's what I want to say about that real quick. Some of you, you're you're on track, right? And you're fired up because you're high-achieving go-getters, right? And you've read every single week. You don't remember anything that you read, but you're on track, right? (laughs) You know what I mean? And that's cool. That's okay. There's others of you that, you know what? You you fell behind a a day or two or 20, okay, at this point. (laughs) And here's what I just want to say. That's okay, too. I'm just encouraging you, keep reading. Keep reading. Wherever you're at, keep reading. And it's okay that you don't understand everything you've read so far. Just because you don't understand everything that you've read so far does not mean that God's not at work in your life. Okay? You got to trust him in that. Okay. Okay. Back to where I was at. All right, uh, so just wanted, to, just wanted to share that. Matthew chapter 7, Jesus goes on, and he also talks in verses 26 and 27 about the opposite. He says there, w- there was a man who didn't build his house on the rock, but he actually built it on the sand, to which everybody said, come on, amen, somebody. You know what I'm saying? That beachfront property, you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, that room with the view, right? He says you have the room with the view, you got that beachfront property, but you built your house on the sand. Now, anybody that's ever been on sand knows it's not a firm foundation. It's shifty all the time. It's constantly moving. It never stays the same. He says he built his house, even though it looked great, built his house on shifting sand. And when the winds came and everything began to blow and beat against the house, it said, great was its collapse. In other words, Jesus says there's there's two choices that you can make in how you want to live your life. There, there's, there's a choice that you and I get to make on, on, on how we want to approach the foundation that our life is built on. He's inviting us to more. He's inviting us to more. But, but we, can't, we can't step into more unless we're willing to actually look at the, the faulty foundations that are in our life. Again, we said awareness is key, so maybe some of us has been there. Like we, we've, instead of establishing on, on God as a foundation and his word, there's some faulty foundations in our life, like things like culture. Like, like, like our culture, it's, uh, we say, well, it's whatever's popular. It's the, it's the end thing. It's, it's, a, it's everybody's doing it. And so because everybody's doing it, that, that, that's, that's what we need to do, right? Uh, let me be honest with you. If you can't tell already, I'm the first guy that loves what's going on in culture, right? I mean, uh, your pastor, I've seen you looking at my shoes all day. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Wondering, like, what did this dude get into, right? Like, these were going to be my Easter shoes, but I made them my summer kickoff shoes. You know what I'm saying? Like... The reality is, is, is I, I love what's in. I, I love things that are on trend. I, I love doing that. Here, here's what you have to know about cultural things, though. They're just not a great foundation. They're always a shaky foundation because what's popular today won't be popular tomorrow. I got three kids, and they needed to go shopping, and we rolled up in Forever 21 because I'm on a budget. Amen, somebody? We rolled up in Forever 21, right? And I cruise into that Forever 21. My kids are moving around. They're, like, you know, dancing and kind of bopping to the songs they're going through. So I just start singing all the songs, right? I just start singing all the songs. They turn and look at me. They're like, Dad, how do you know these songs? I'm like, excuse me. This is my music, and I don't know if you know, that's all my style right there. <laughs> And they were like, what? I'm like, yeah, 90s is, are in. Like, if you don't know, the 90s are back, right? Like, like uh, uh, and, and they're looking at me like I'm crazy. I'm like, you're welcome. You know what I'm saying? Like, you only know about this stuff because of me. You know what I'm saying? Like, my generation, right? I mean, and, and they were kind of blown away. But, but isn't that true of, of, of pop culture? Like, like, it's just a recurring cycle, right? 90s are in right now, but you know what? I guarantee you bell bottoms are coming quickly, <laughs> Right? 
they're coming right back, right? 60s and 70s will be here before you know it, and everybody's going to be rocking that next trend, right? right? Here, here's what popular culture does. Popular culture always comes and goes, but truth never changes. Truth always remains the same. Truth stays consistent. Culture wants to feed our physical need, but you know what? It can't give us life like truth does. Think about this for a second. John 6, 63, it says, The Spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words that I have spoken to you, understand this about the word of God. They are full of spirit and life. Full of spirit and life. Yeah, you can crave other things and you can want this and want that and you can, yeah, whatever, rock that shirt. Here's you. I take good care of my shoes, somebody, right? I take good care, right? But here's what I know. Even taking good care of my shoes, they're going to wear out over time. Even if I never wore them, eventually the glue will start to dilapidate, right? The seams will start to come undone. All the leather will stretch all by itself. Why? Because it was never meant to last. Truth lasts. Truth, it remains the same. What about this? What about building our, our foundation of life on tradition? It might get uncomfortable. I'm just going to give you the preface real quick. Because some of us, we've been caught up in a lot of tradition. And here's what I want to say about tradition. Uh, uh, tradition's cool. Right? I mean, Pastor Troy loves the King James Version. You know what I'm saying? Like, he speaks in King James sometimes. You know what I mean? Like, we just, we just love him anyway. You know what I'm saying? Like, we're going to love well and lead well. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's, that's just what we do. Here's the reality. Sometimes we get so caught up in tradition, and tradition becomes this, this forever foundation uh, on our life. But, but there's a danger in, in building your life on tradition instead of, instead of truth. See, when we build our lives on what always has been done over and over, that's all we ever know. And for us, it kind of makes sense because we feel like, well, that's just all the way we've always done it. That's just the way that it's always been. And so because the way we've always done it and the way it's always been, well, then that should be the way that it should always should be. And here's what I say. No. No, it shouldn't be. Like, I, I'm, I'm going to tell you, I don't think tradition is all bad. I don't think, I, I like some tradition. I like some of the traditions that me and my family have around Christmas time or around certain other holidays and things like that. But just like culture, tra tradition is just not a firm foundation on, on which we can stand. Be because tradition, tradition, we do it now because it works, but no tradition will last forever. Traditions will be eventually become obsolete. Tradition will eventually become invalid. Tradition will eventually fail. Because the problem happens when we hold so tight to the tradition that we're so fired up for that tradition that we ultimately forsake truth. We squeeze, squeeze the truth right out be, because in lieu of our, our favorite traditions. That's why you see all, all kinds of uh, frustration. That's why, that's why people get so worked up anytime something has to change. Because well, we used to do it like this, and now we're doing it like that, and I, don't, I just don't get it. Right? And, and it's oh, oh, because we're holding so tight to the way it used to be done or the way it always has been done. And now we can't experience the new thing that God's trying to do among us. We can't experience the new thing. Here's what we have to understand. When we get caught up fighting over methods all the time and we miss out on the mission and the message every single time. We have to be willing not to fight over the method. We have to stand on the word of God and know that his message stays the same, that the mission is still the mission, but the, message, the method could be flipped up, turned upside down, twisted. That's why I love that City Line Church is a church that experiments. You see these kids come up here and sing about Jesus today? Where did they learn that? Did they learn that in here? No, they learned that in their neighborhoods all week long at Neighborhood BBS. To where we said as a church, what if we took Jesus to the streets and not just said, hey, everybody, come over here and hang out and watch this really cool show. I know it doesn't feel good. I know it rubs some of you the wrong way because you're like, well, I, think, I still think VBS should be in the church. That's why we have kids' church. That's why we have it every weekend. That's why we do things for our kids to continue to, to grow and develop. But the reality is, is we, we're always called to those who aren't here yet. How will they know unless we go to them? Okay, I'm going to keep going. Okay. <laughs> Only gave me so much time, and I'm just, I'm, I, feel, I feel God stirring in a different direction, so I'm just going to try to hold it. What, what, what about this script? Mark 7, 8, you, 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 you've let go of the commands of God. This is what happens. You've let go of the commands of God, and now you're holding on to human tradition. So we fight for tradition, and, and we let go of the commands of God. Well, what if we redirected that and begin to hold on to God and what he's doing and allow him to change and direct us? What about this? What about reason? 
sometimes it's reason, right? We, we've got all this, this reason. We say things like, well, uh, I'm just going to think this through. And, and once I figure it out, you know, then, then I'll know the, the real deal. I'm just going to, I'm going to think on this a little bit and I'll come up with my own conclusion on what all this means and all this stuff like that. Here's what I want you to know about reason. Uh, and I say this all the time. God has given us the ability to reason. We should use our minds and we should think, but we should also understand that your and my reasoning is not infallible. That your and my reasoning is not without error. The reality is, is that we actually need God and his wisdom. We can't just think, I got this, I'll do this, I don't need anybody's help with this, you watch, I'll show you. Because you know what happens? Every single time that you fail in those moments when you realize you don't have it and you didn't get it and you did need some help, now it becomes harder and harder every time you push people away to say, you know what, I screwed up, I messed up, I made a mistake and now I need some help. Understand this, Proverbs 28, 26 says, those who trust in themselves are fools, but those who walk in wisdom are kept safe. God is time and time again calling us to the importance of, of wisdom. In fact, Proverbs, again, Proverbs would be another book. If you, it's, it's a book all about wisdom. Again, when you are done with the book of John, I would say transition over to Proverbs. Proverbs is 31 chapters. Okay? You got one chapter for every day of the month in a month that has 31 days, right? You know, I just want to make, make sure you're tracking on the math with me, right? But those who trust in themselves are fools, but those who walk in wisdom, they're, they're, they're kept safe. I don't know about you, but, but I desire wisdom. I need more of God's wisdom in my life. I, I need more of God's wisdom to make decisions. I know that I can't do it on my own. What, what about this one? Emotions. Anybody been there? I'm just going to build my foundation of life on my emotions, on the way that I'm feeling. If it feels right, I'm going to do that. If it feels good, I'm going to do that. And we say this all the time, but here's what you need to know about living your life built on the foundation of emotions. I hate to break it to you, but emotions lie to you. Emotions lie to you a lot. Emotions, in fact, I believe that we lie to ourselves more than we lie to anybody else around us. We cause ourselves to think and believe things that never even existed. We cause and think ourselves to think about things that people think about us that they never even thought about us. You see where I'm going with that? Now you understand, we, 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 our mind plays all these crazy tricks on us, but then we say, well, I'm just going to go with the way I feel. I'm going to go with my, my instinct. I'm going, to, I'm going to go with it, but, but, but it ends us in, in a wrong direction every single time. In fact, Proverbs 16, 25 says there's a way that appears to be right. We, we, it feels right. It feels like we're supposed to do this. But yet at the end, without wisdom, you see, there's no wisdom in here, right? It's, it's absent of wisdom. We're just going off our own thoughts and feelings. Those things ultimately lead to death. Just, it's just emptiness. It's just, it's just destructive at the end of the day. We don't make progress. We, we don't grow. We, we don't move forward. We're just held captive by our emotions. Our emotions keep us just kind of locked in. I love how God's word is so incredibly different. David, he was an emotional guy, but you know what David realized about God's word? He says in Psalm 119, 105, your word is a lamp unto my feet, and it's a light unto my path. Right? He talks about this idea of it's, it's wisdom to me. And those who put their faith in God, those who lived out what we read in Scripture, they understood God's word to be something that's an unshakable foundation, that it does not fail. In fact, Jesus himself, write this Scripture down, Matthew 24, Matthew 24, verse 35. Jesus says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words never will pass away. All this stuff, everything's going to go, but you know what? God, God's word remains faithful. God's word remains true. God's word remains a solid foundation to which we arrive at a point. We say, okay, Jack, this is awesome. This is great. I, I love it. Like, that's cool. Like, I, I kind of get it. You know what I mean? But, but I still have struggle when I'm reading scripture. I still struggle to, to, to understand some things. There's just so much that I, I still don't understand. And, and I don't know that I'm able to agree with it if I can't, can't fully understand it. Here's what I want to encourage you. I want to take you back to week one and remind you, you need to be able to trust that God wants to teach you. That even as you're reading these scriptures and you don't fully understand these scriptures, you choose to trust that God, he wants to teach you. That if God's word is indeed God's word and his word is true, it just requires you taking a step of faith and knowing that I don't have to understand all of it to be able to agree with all of it. 
I don't have to fully articulate all of it to, to fully understand all of it. And if God is bigger than me, and if God's thoughts are higher than my thoughts, and if God's ways are mightier than my ways, then at some point there are going to be things that I just don't understand in Scripture. I'm there. It doesn't matter how long I've been in church, how I grew up in church, how long I've been in ministry. There are some times that I still scratch my head and I'm like, God, I need you to continue to work in my heart to understand what this means. God, I don't fully understand and get this. And there's been times, uh, dun, 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 you know what I'm saying, where I feel like I've got it wrong. I've read it and I got it wrong. But I only realized that I got it wrong as I sat in it and kept reading and kept seeking God and said, God, I need you to reveal this to me. Help me to understand better your word because here's what I'm thinking and feeling. But God, I don't want to go on my own feelings and emotions. God, I want to connect with you so you can open up my heart to what you are trying to teach me. It's a different approach when we, when we take that, that approach. But then some would say, well, well okay, I get that. But, but, but what happens when I read something that I do understand, but I don't like it? I mean, what happens when I read something I do fully understand? I just, I just don't know that I, that, that I like it that much. And here, here's what I want to say. I, I get it. I, I do believe that that happens sometimes. But here's what I want you to listen really close. Look, look you, you don't have to like it. But if God's word is going to be the foundation of your life, you do have to choose to submit to it. You, you don't have to like it, but you do have to choose to submit to it. I, I'm going to be honest with you. You don't always have to like something to be obedient towards something. I'm going to preach right now. I got a few more minutes left, right? Like here, you, you, you don't always have to like, parent, parents in the room or, or just growing, everybody was a kid at one day, you know what I'm saying? Like you, you all grew up, you remember your parents told you, hey, don't do that. Or my answer is no right now. Or you know what? No, you can't go there. Or you know what? No, you can't do this. And you were so frustrated because you had your mind made up. You're like, I'm going to miss out. You know what I mean? Like everybody's going to be there and I'm not because you said no. You're the meanest ever. You know, you're like going on and on and on and all this stuff right there. You know what? You know what your parents were asking you to do in that moment? They weren't asking you to like their decision. They were simply asking you to be obedient and trust them in their decision making. That they had a reason that maybe you couldn't see, that you didn't understand of why you couldn't do this, go there, be that, or do whatever else you wanted to do. It didn't require you to like what they had to say for you to choose to be obedient to that thing. It's the same when we're following God. If God is higher than us, if he's bigger than us, if he knows more than we do, he's going to call us to some things that are challenging to us. But just because we don't like it doesn't mean that we shouldn't be obedient to it. Obedience is always a choice. You have to choose obedience. Obedience doesn't just happen. Obedience comes out of moving in faith, willing to trust in God and who he says that he is. This is so important for us to, to, to fully understand that our, our obedience is, is our choice. And sometimes, sometimes understanding is on the other end of obedience. And you have to understand that it's always obedience that precedes the blessing. It's always obedience that actually says, hey, this is an open door now for God to be able to bless you because not only do you trust God, but you could be trusted with what God wants to give to you. Man, next one. Make daily engagement a priority. Why did I spend so much time on the foundational piece? Because here's what I'm, again, I want you to say, if you can't establish God's word as the foundation for your life, these next three things that we just need to go over, it just doesn't, like I said, it's good practical steps, but, but, but it doesn't have the significance as it should if you're choosing to make God's word the foundation for your life, that you, you choose to make God's word, uh, make, make a daily engagement a, a priority, that you choose to engage in God's word. Priorities are a matter of what's most important. Jesus talked about what's most important in our life. Matthew 6, he says, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And then all these other things that you worry about, that you're praying about, that you're worried how this is gonna work out, all those other things, God's at work taking care of that. But his goal for your life is not to just give you everything you want. His goal for your life is to actually build your life into all that he's created you for that you would begin to take steps of faith and trusting him, but you got to seek first his kingdom, his righteousness, and then all those other things are added to you as well. So what does that look like? Well, it simply is pick a time, choose a place, and be present. Pick a time, choose a place, and be present. That you choose to be intentional about spending time engaging in the word of God. 
Now, that could be morning for you. That could be afternoon. That could be after your lunch break. That could be on your lunch break. It could be at night before you go to bed. But here's what I want to say about that. Make it yours. Okay? I grew up in a, in a church environment where I heard weird things like, you got to get alone with God. you got to get in your prayer closet and close the door and just get alone. I was like, that's weird. Nobody wants to be in a closet with God. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's, I don't. What they were saying was that you got to carve out the space to be alone with God, to, to pick a time, choose a place, and be present. What they were trying to say with the closet analogy was you got to remove distraction. You got to get that stuff out of the way so you can get alone with God. And then I heard other people in my life try to speak into my life and say, you know what you got to do? You just got to get up early in the morning and you got to get alone with God. You got to do your daily devotion with God in the morning. Well, that's awesome until I realized I'm not a morning person. I'm not a morning person, right? And so here's what I want to say. If you get up early in the morning, great for you. God bless you. We love you. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Spend some time with God in the morning. I'm sure it's going to be refreshing for you and him. But if you are not a morning person, don't do God like that, okay? <laughs> like, like don't, don't, don't be mean to God. You know what I'm saying? Like, God, God wants to enjoy his time with you as well, right? So pick a time that works better for you. Likewise, if you're a night person, right? Like, if you're a night person and you're one of those kinds of people that can read a book, you know, before you go to bed, it's how you wind down and get ready to lay your head on the pillow. Man, God bless you. I don't know how you do that. You give me a book if I'm laying down, I'm out. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm done. Like, I don't even remember anything. And some of you, you're there, you've tried it. You lay down in your bed, you're going to pray before you go to sleep, and you end up sleep praying right? Don't sleep pray on God. Don't start out with two sentences, wake up at two in the morning and be like, God, you understand. Amen. Right? Like that does, that, that's not, that's not a picking a time, choosing a place or being present, right? So pick what works best for you. Utilize the tools that we've given you. Utilize the tools on your daily devotional in John. Utilize the soap method that, that Pastor Troy talked about last week. Use these tools that are available to you so you can take those next steps with Jesus because the next step then is choosing to grow deeper in my understanding. That I choose to grow deeper in my understanding of God and his word. It's not that I just come to church and listen and hear. And stuff like that. No, it's just that I choose to not just engage and read a couple things, but I'm taking those Bible study methods and I'm choosing to sit in scripture a little longer. I'm choosing to wrestle through it a little more. Paul says it this way in Colossians 3.16. He says, you got to let the message of Christ dwell among you richly. I love this key word, Let. You, you got to let this happen. You, you got to choose to dwell on the word of God. You got to choose to meditate on the scriptures. You got to choose to commit them to memory. You got to choose to write them out. You got to choose not to just sit and read them, but actually to go to the next step and begin to dwell on the implications of what does that look like in my life? God, what are the things that you're calling me to? God, God what do you want to do in and through me? And this is important. Because another question I want you to wrestle with is, what are the things that influence your life? What are the things that influence your life? Is it Fortnite? Is it your Xbox? Is it your job? What are the things that influence your life? Is it your negative friends? Is it your controlling friends? What is it that's influencing your life? Is it, I mean, you can pick any number of directions, but here's what you need to understand about those things that influence your life. You actually begin to take on the nature and character of the thing that is the biggest influence in your life. You have to know that. that this is what you become like when you're allowing it to influence your life. When you dwell on the word of God, when you allow the message of Christ to dwell in you, here's what happens. His message, his word goes in, and here's what happens. It comes right back out. It becomes a part of who you are. Same way if you're hanging out with your negative friends. They negative, negative, you're like, oh, they're always so negative. But over time, if you'll watch yourself, you'll see that you'll be starting to get a lot more negative just like them. Unless you allow that to not be an influence in your life anymore, and you get more of the word of God in your life, and as you get God's word in your life, when that negativity comes out, you'll be able to redirect with the truth of God. Think how that works, God's truth. It never fails. It's a strong foundation. It enables us to grow deeper in him as we let the message of Christ draw richly in us. What does that look like? It looks like growth always requiring commitment. <laughs> Silence, right? It's that big C word, right? Commitment, the, the thing that everybody struggles with. 
relationally, you, you name it, anytime, like, I mean, on the job, I mean, uh, taking next steps, serving in a role, right, whatever it is, that commitment piece is that thing that always, but you gotta understand this, growth only comes by commitment. In other words, if you're here today and your marriage is struggling, I don't have to sit here and preach all day long to let you know that, you know what, growth is going to require a commitment to you guys growing together with one another, getting in the word of God together, getting some counseling, getting some help, taking some next steps. You can talk all day about wanting your marriage to thrive, but until you commit to doing something about helping your marriage thrive, guess what? You're just going to keep talking about it. Why? Because growth requires commitment. And you have the opportunity to grow in healthy ways or you have the opportunity to grow in unhealthy ways. But I love that this idea of let, let the message of Christ dwell in you, that's, that's your decision of choice. That's where you get to choose to lean into what God has for you to build your life on the rock or to continue to tread through the shifting sand. And I get it, there's going to be all kinds of distractions that say, I can't commit. There's going to be procrastination. There's going to be fatigue. There's going to be excuses. There's going to be busy schedule. There's going to be all this stuff that would try to hinder you from engaging God's word. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to press through and begin to commit. And here's what I mean by commitment. Commitment means staying loyal to what you said that you were going to do long after the mood that you set it in left you. We can sit in church on Sunday and say all kinds of stuff, but it's different to take a next step and commit to doing stuff. And we get all excited about reading God's word because we read a scripture and we felt like we fully understood it. And then we kept reading and for like a week and a half later, we understood nothing, right? And that shine kind of wore off a little bit. Here's the reality. Just keep pressing in. Just stay committed to the process. Trust that God is working in your life and that growth is happening even when you can't see it because that growth will ultimately produce something incredible in your life, especially when the winds come and the rains come and the storms brewing and all hell is breaking loose in your life. I remember Jesus. Jesus was actually, he was tempted by the enemy himself, right? He was tempted. And this is gonna be your next point. It's just remembering what you read and and implementing using what you know. Okay, Jesus was tempted in the desert. He was going into ministry. You remember this from week one? And Jesus said, it is written. His response to the enemy in his temptation wasn't like, oh, you got me this time, and oh, this is so hard, and oh, man, why do you keep saying that kind of stuff? No, his, his response to the enemy was, it is written. It is written. Why could he say that it is? is written because he was willing to remember what he knew and use what he knew. He remembered what he had read. He understood those Old Testament scriptures. He quoted from them all the time. He utilized that in his life. James talks about that as well. He says, don't merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves, but do what it says. Just do what it says. In other words, (laughs) The enemy comes to tempt Jesus, and Jesus says back and says, It is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes out of the mouth of God. He steps up and he says, Hey, in my temptation, I'll remember who God is, and I'll remember what God said. Sometimes we need to do that in our life. When everything is just out of control and everything is busting loose, it's not to be overcome with our situation, not to be overcome with our emotions, not to be overcome with everybody's voice around us. It's to simply sit in the word of God and be reminded of who God is and what God said, that I am a masterpiece, that I do have a purpose, that he has chose me, that I am a child of God, that I am a friend of God, and that with his help and his power at work in my life, I am going to be victorious in and through this we stand upon the word of God which is power and which is authority being filled by the Holy Spirit as we place our faith in Jesus and now he equips us with what scripture calls the sword of the spirit so that when the enemy comes on attack we don't sit back and go "Hmm." no no we lift up our sword of faith in Jesus name and we speak it out and we call what is is according to the word of God What he says, it's true, it's unshakable, it's a strong foundation. What am I saying? I'm saying we accept his authority. We assimilate his truth in our life, and we apply it. We live it out. We don't just sit back and be scared and afraid. No, 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 no. We we choose 
to live it out. We accept the authority of the word of God. We establish it as a firm foundation in our life. We assimilate God's word in our life. We apply it in every situation. I'm gonna invite uh, the worship team to come back out because I want us to just celebrate in a song together in just a few moments. But as I kind of wrap this up, just just one last key thought. Uh, uh, The late Eugene Peterson, uh, he says this way, he says, Christ followers don't simply learn or study or use scripture. He says, we assimilate it. He says, we take it into our lives in such a way that it gets metabolized into acts of love, cups of cold water, missions into all the world, healing and evangelism and justice in Jesus's name, hands raised in adoration of the father, feet washed in company with the son. This is is what happens when you accept its authority and you assimilate it in your life and you begin to apply it. Understanding that the scriptures are powerful enough in themselves that we need to know where we stand with them. In that, we don't conform the Bible to fit us. We allow God's word to transform us. We don't just pick and choose things that we like best, leave out the stuff that we don't like or don't understand. No, 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 no. That's conforming the Bible to fit the way that we want to live and how we want to go about life. Instead, we simply engage the word of God. We allow God to teach us and it becomes transformative. It's not information processing. It's life transformation that is actually happening by the power of God at work in our life. It's game changing. It's life changing. Now, we started out this series by, by verbally, like speaking the word of God out together. And so I want to end this series in the same way. So I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet because this is going to be part of our worship. When I was growing up as a kid, I, I was in church. My dad is a pastor, still is pastoring. And as a pastor's kid, I participated in youth group just like every other kid. And as I participated in youth group, I think one of the first scriptures that I ever knew was John 3.16. The second scripture I ever knew was Jesus wept, like Troy talked about last week. But the third scripture that I committed to memory was because I had a person in in our youth group, one of our youth leaders that kept driving this home over and over again, would make us recite it every time we showed up until we committed it to memory. So today I want us to just speak it out. I want to let the words of God just kind of settle in our heart and hopefully it'll penetrate past just the exterior and get to the core of who we are because I think this is so Significant. It's found in Psalms 119, 10 and 11. On the count of three, one, two, three, I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Think of the power in those words when we're able to engage the word of God, not just know about scripture, but apply scripture in our life, assimilate it, let it get metabolized into who we are. We take the next step and we begin to call out to God, 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 we don't want to lose this power. God, we, we want to know more about you. God, we want to strengthen our relationship. So God, would you help us to hold on to your commands? And God, would you help me to hide your word in my heart, God, so that I will not sin against you? My prayer is that for us as a church is that even though this series comes to, to an end, that this is just the beginning of engagement as we dive in to all that God has for our life. Let's pray, and then we're going to worship together. God, thank you. Thank you for your love, your grace, your mercy. Thank you, Jesus, Lord God, that you see us, you know us, God, that you care for us, Jesus. Lord God, you've given us your word. Lord God, not just as words on a page, God, but as a foundation for our life. God, a true foundation, a firm foundation that is not shaky, but one that stands the test of time. So, Lord, I pray. Lord God, that as we trust in you, God, and as we take a next step in engaging your word, Lord, that you would enliven our hearts, Lord God, to who you are and what you want to do in us and through us. And we thank you in advance for what's to come. We celebrate you now in Jesus' name.